Welcome, Wargamers, to the notable tourism destinations of the Mortal Realms, because today we are talking about Anvilgard in our ongoing discussion of the city as we go through all the different Cubicle 7 supplements for Soulbound. So here we are in the Realm of Fire, exploring Anvilgard, or Harkuron. We started off by a discussion of it from a kind of a third-person historical perspective on, on where it's been in Age of Sigmar in general, and then had like a, a first-person perspective walk through the city in my last video. Well, in this one here, I had mentioned that there were a few different notable locations that even though the book has a ton of them, I think there's like 45 or 50, a few just stood out to me as being extremely interesting. And GMs, if you are listening and you want to take some of these and kind of build them into your quests and missions and that kind of stuff, please go ahead. But just be assured there's a ton more locations that are also really cool. These are the ones that just stood out to me, right? If I, if I saw like the American mall diagram that had all the different locations listed off. These are the ones that I would be like, I want to go there. I want to know what that's all about. And that's how we're going to cover kind of, I think, some of the higher points of the city. I've broken it down to a few different, um, you know, kind of categories or so. But what I want to do is pick out the coolest parts about this city so that you can have something to look forward to when you come back from your adventures out and abroad. It also sheds a lot of light into the characters and the dynamics existing within Anvil Guard itself. We had talked about just a lot of tension, both in at, well, government and civic tension, but also just on a day-to-day -day level with the different kinds of fantasy races intermingling and trying to survive a very, very hostile environment. So let's see what the stunning entrepreneurs of the mortal realms came up with that environment. Now, one thing I'd like to add up top here before we go too quickly, if you're interested in Age of Sigmar, Soulbound, or any kind of hobby gaming supplies, please consider using any one of the affiliate links in my link tree down below. You'll see exactly how much money you save, and every time you do, it goes directly to supporting me, my wife, our cats, the whole channel, and I truly am so grateful for each and every one of you who does. I also want to throw out there that Baron of Dice has recently partnered with me for some official 2 plus tough dice, and if you yourself would like to roll sixes one sixth of the time every time go grab yourself a set and that really actually to be serious is one of the best ways to support my family because baron of dice is awesome about profit sharing and it just goes a long way to supporting and making my life happen now in jumping into our discussion of cool places in anvil guard i want to start with a, a few landmarks okay the first one being the bleak scale harbor if you kick off your exploration with Anvil Guard, uh, specifically doing the Shadow and the Mist campaign, the harbor is where you will be spending a lot of time. In fact, it makes up a huge portion of the city. What we call the harbor isn't like in our real world where we have you know the city and there's maybe like a small sub-district that's the harbor with the actual docks and stuff like that. This is like an immense amount of the actual real estate of Anvil Guard is built upon docks out on the sea because it's really hard to keep pushing deeper into the jungle. But you can keep building outward into the ocean. It is a labyrinth of docks, levees, bridges. It's all meant to unload, load, refit, build ships at an enormous scale and rate. Meaning these are everything from massive pirate ships for the privateers to small support dinghies meant to just bring supplies from point A to point B. And it's so big to the point where if you are out on the furthest point of the docks themselves, small bars and inns have been built out there because it's so much of a pain to make your way all the way to shore that if you're just gonna be in and out in a day, you know, why not just drink here? Hop off the boat, there's a small bar, like maybe a block or two away, it's on the docks, who needs to go to the land? In fact, the harbor itself is so big that it has its own good and bad sides of town, in quotes there, if you know what I mean. Um, areas where patrols happen a little less frequently. Places where there's more or less lights. Things might look professional to attract a certain kind of clientele who values those things. But there's also dark harbor corners that are filled with etch-a-sketch folks who are all too happy to take advantage of tourists who aren't paying attention. Notably, if you do anything interacting with naval affairs, you're probably going to end up here, but that's really worth noting because uh, the city of Anvilgard may be on land, but it's beating heart. It's a lot of its infrastructure, a lot of the effort it puts into and how its military assets are allocated. It's all swallowed up into the harbor. It's where all the money and the bodies 
and the, the dignitaries, all that kind of like important stuff comes through. And I like that one quite a bit. Now, I also have a few different uh, honorable mentions here as far as landmarks go. The first one here is the Oculus Ignis. This is a massive arcane lighthouse that dominates the Searing Sea, this entire bay that Anvil Guard is located in. And really, it makes navigating the area possible because, because it's you know a magic lighthouse rather than a normal one, it can pierce the mists and the ash of the harbor. So people can use it as a point of reckoning and, and also kind of understand where they are in relation to the other ships, the harbor, the land, all of it. But interestingly enough, the people of Anvilgard did not build it. This is an artifact left over from the Age of Myth, a pre-current timeline civilization. It's made of marble and glass. Its true design, like what it's supposed to do, is unclear, but the light it emits is so powerful that it's just been nothing but a gift for the growth of Anvilgard. They stumbled upon it and were like, we can use that. That said, since the Necroquake ruled the, the realms over with a wave of death magic, the Oculus Ignis has changed. The light it gives off now has more of a sickly glow rather than being, you know, this perfect piercing of the shadows. It's almost like it was stained or smothered somehow. And now at its base, you can hear like whispers and murmurs on the wind. And basically, I mention it because no matter how you make it to Anvil Guard, all locations in and around the city can see the beacon of the Oculus Ignis. It's a point of reference for any adventure or campaign, and it's vital to mapping the region. Now, the next location I wanna talk about is the Silent Auction. The Silent Auction is a shop that really embodies the shady side of Anvil Guard and, and how things happen without detection, okay? It's a fairly common rumor that the markets and auctions occasionally spring up and cater to exclusive clientele and then vanish before patrols can spot them. The trick is knowing where they're going to be before they happen. And, and realistically, these are generally like temporary stores for the ultra wealthy and the deeply unlawful. The silent auction is one such place. The guards have heard of it, so it's a location that can be discussed, but they've never been able to find it. And that's because it's not, not really a place at all, at least not in the way we normally think of it. This is something that the locals might be able to nudge you towards, but as an example of, of what Anvil Guard is like, the silent auction is basically a shop that only appears when a collection of pleasure yachts all join up and form one superstructure. It's held in the shadow of a black arc, one of the monstrous floating fortresses of the Scourge privateers. So, you know, the cops are looking for a place on the harbor, but this isn't a specific place. And also it's hidden behind some of the shadiest people that the cops don't want to ever cross. And it's at places like this, you can find a bunch of stuff, a bunch of artifacts, people, information, contacts to the underworld. And you can also leverage things against these folks. For example, if you were to witness a nobleman buy an illicit artifact, maybe corrupted by chaos or something, that's good intel. That's leverage right there. Other mysterious uh, shops exist, and the book details many of them, but I don't want to spoil too much. I just wanted to pick this one because I felt like it exemplifies how the city functions. It's just a lot of um, hearsay. It's a lot of, you know, non-official communication to set up events that just always happen to dissipate right before the law appears. The next location I have for you is the Bellows. The, the Bellows is part weapons workshop and part manufacturing mega plant, okay? And you'll hear it before you see it. In fact, it's noise level, it's, it's the defining trait of this entire place. Simply put, this is the Iron Weld Arsenal's headquarters and manufacturing base for Anvil Guard. Yeah, they make a bunch of weapons, tons of weapons. But more importantly, they forge the endless supply of pipeworks needed to deliver the city's defoliant systems. Basically all the weed killers we talked about that are constantly dousing poison on the jungle around them to keep it at bay. That's where all of this is made. This weapons grade weed killer is produced here and then delivered through pipeworks uh, throughout the different, city, different parts of the city. And I bring this up because it is a vitally important industry that keeps Anvil Guard habitable. Although there's an asterisk next to that because 
There's still a little tension on whether or not this stuff is actually non-toxic to humans, elves, and uh, dwarves or whatever, but whatever. Throughout all the city, you will feel the presence of, of the bellows in your average trip. From the fact that weeds aren't there, you know, the jungle is not growing in over you, to the weapons you have equipped in you. You'll hear hammering that's left many humans and Duarden nearly deaf. You'll breathe the officially non-toxic defoliant, and you'll miss its absence the second you step out of the city. Moving on to places of worship, you know, there was, of course, Sigmarite temples. Those necessarily weren't destroyed when the city fell to Marathi's hands, but certainly the temples of Marathi were elevated to new heights. And so one of those is Hag's Sacrament. This is a Canite temple that jets out of the earth like a jagged spear. It's a very high-walled and narrow gladiatorial pit. Now, because these are the Daughters of Cain, church and blood sport kind of mingle more than other religions. And so these ladies love it, right? This is this is the temple of Neltnar, I believe it's how it's pronounced, or Keltnar, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. And inside its guts are near constant battles by deeply trained warriors. But understand this, if you were to go into this place and try betting on a fighter or even cheering for one, you'd be thrown out at best, killed at worst. Because for the Daughters of Cain, this is their religious custom. And bringing money or praise into it sullies the act of devotion. To that end, most of the attendees are other Daughters of Cain either within your temple or from others just to watch. Which is interesting to me because for as powerful a force as the Daughters of Cain are in the city, their more visible aspects in terms of like the slaughter and the bloodshed are more subdued. This is a very tame thing. The other big choice, of course, is the High Temple of Sigmar, and in contrast, it has throngs of pilgrims rushing to it. Uh, it set itself out, uh, sorry, apart as a beacon of hope and refuge in the realm of fire, and opposed to the dark concrete of Anvilgard's regular buildings, the High Temple of Sigmar was built from white stone mined from Azir itself. Its perimeter is lined with statues of Sigmar looking over the city and over his people. Now, your character may not be particularly religiously inclined, but these are very important locations to the city because, again, they are just direct tie-ins to that internal strife going on. It used to be Sigmar's, and then Marathi stole it. Now, I have two more sites that I want to throw out there just because I think they're interesting in regards to other factions. The first one is the Spire Root. This is a Sylvaneth enclave, essentially like a delegate's kind of respite. You see, they can't live in the city themselves, at least the way everybody else does, because of all the different ash and the, um, basically the weed killer going around that they're using to fumigate the forest. And so, what the Sylvaneth has done is they suspended a treehouse with vines above the mist's level. So, you see this whole horizon of, of skyscrapers coming off in the, in the city in the distance, and then nestled in between a couple of them, is sort of what looks like a bird's nest, but suspended by different vines and roots. And it binds all the buildings together. And in that little like nook in that center of that nest is the Sylvaneth Embassy. It sounds exceptionally complicated to enter. I'd imagine you have to ride or teleport something in there. Um, but here's the thing, the Sylvaneth are vital allies in the defense of Anvil Guard. Remember, even though we're trying to douse everything with a weed killer, immediately outside of this wall is one of the densest jungles around. Any enemies that try to go through that are first of all going to have a hard time logistically, just literally going through the forest. But also, imagine if that entire time you were harried and harassed by Sylvaneth, who are going to report to Anvilgard all the information that they need to be ready, right? Your corn army is walking through the jungle, the Sylvaneth are hitting them, attacking them, debilitating the army as much as they can, all the while reporting back, hey, here's how many skull cannons are rocking up. We're going to try to take those out first, but hey, here's how many blood warriors, here's who's leading it, all this kind of information the entire time, because the forest at this point are not just your allies, they're your eyes and ears. And the last location here that I want to talk about is the fire pits. Um, any good hold in Akshi also needs access to fire slayers, because why not? There's good coin to be earned here. 
and where there's coin, there's mercenaries. Or the Fire Slayers can act as master craftsmen, city defenders, all of that. And they can go on as many pilgrimages to reclaim Urgold as they want, because it only benefits the city by cleaving danger out of the jungle. Again, it's just more stuff that your allies have a natural inclination to help you. It works because we all have a reason to help each other, to support one another. And so let's end this video like I end all of them. Why are these locations important? And the truth is, they're technically not. I mean, there are like five or six out of 45, as I mentioned before, but I picked them out specifically because I thought they were cool. I like the idea of the fire pits and the um, Sylvaneth Enclave because how they work with their allies, especially knowing how weird of a city this is, just given the fact that it's mostly Dark Elves as opposed to any other, makes that a different kind of relation. We got a sense of the religious schism within the city between Marathi and Sigmar, uh, its major industries, how its markets work, and also kind of notable landmarks. All in all, I think it's a very cool place to explore. Each one of those concentric rings of the city we mentioned is going to have its own nooks and crannies, its own stores, inns, bars, you know, all this kinds of stuff. Go explore it all. And when we get back here in my next video on the series, we're going to be going out into the Shadow of the Mist campaign and start actually engaging the world around Anvil Guard and the Realm of Fire as a whole. So thank you all so much for hanging out with me, and I cannot wait to catch you in my next Age of Sigmar video. Happy Wargaming, friends!